Transition partners take mental health very seriously. We are now supporting Claro Mental Health Charity, who are local and based in Harrogate. We are working closely with Richard Kenny, who is the IT director at Tech Buyer. Claro operates as a commercial workshop making goods for businesses, which enable those with long-term mental health conditions to function in a vol- voluntary real work environment. We would love it if you can join us in supporting this amazing Amazing cause and charity and donate what you can any any amount would be greatly appreciated thank you very much and thanks to all our listeners hi this is the let's talk leadership podcast my name is ellie greeny And my name's Sandra Patel-Stewart. On this podcast, we will be interviewing some of the UK's greatest tech leaders. We'll be discussing war stories, battle scars, and their learnings from their journeys. Hopefully, you will pick up some great tips, learn from others' experiences, and have a good laugh along the way. And welcome to the Let's Talk Leadership podcast. I'm so excited today because we've got Frank Schlesinger on the show. So Frank is the CTO of Berlin-based Orderbird, who are a highly successful startup that provides iPad POS system for restaurants. Previous to this, he worked in leadership roles for a number of companies, including a well-known Immobilian Scout 24. Is that how you say it, Frank? <laughs> I, I like how you say it. It's one really? Of Is that wrong? <laughs> oh, no. it's, it's great. <laughs> so Frank has worked in a range of roles from Scrum Master to Head of Product Management and has vast experience, although also has a genuine passion for leadership, which is driven by wanting to find more effective and efficient ways for people to work together, which must show from your background in being a Scrum Master, I'm sure. Yes, I think it does, though, though um, it, it took me some years to really figure out what drives me in hindsight. So yeah. I was doing a couple of jobs and then I look back and say, oh, that is what drives me. But let me say it's a pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you. we're so thank happy you. to have you on the show. Yeah, really, really pleased to have you on the show. And um, it's great um, to now for Ellie and I to do a bit of social distance recording as well, because before when we were in lockdown, we were doing them separately. So, um, which is fantastic. But yeah, it's, it's great to meet you. Um, so I'll um, I'll kick off with with a couple of questions. What I always like to um, to kind of start these things with is is setting the um, I guess setting the scene and giving a bit of context to the listeners and um, finding out a bit more about you um so this is all about you today <laughs> so, if you could, <laughs> so if you could start with just um i guess telling us all how your career started how you got into tech right at the very beginning um, and um, if you could just give us a little bit of detail of that journey that you've taken to get yourself to, to where you are today as, as a, a highly successful CTO. Mm-hmm. So, so I think, uh, as I said, in hindsight, right, you, you realize things, you, 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 you come to some insights about yourself. And in, in hindsight, I have to say that I was always, even as a, as a trial, I was always super interested in technology and how things work and i wanted to understand those things and also i wanted to control them by by doing something with them and they would basically obey to my command so this, <laughs> this kind of thing and, and and so when 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 i finally finally got my first computer at the age of 14 which is not which back then was normal nowadays mm-hmm. kids have that pretty much very earlier in their life already <laughs> yeah so like 14 i got this machine and then i immediately started putting all my energy and attention to, to that computer and learning mm-hmm. how it's functioning, but also opening opening the bond, looking looking inside, understanding how things are connected, also in terms of software. I wanted to do more than just use it. And so pretty straightforward, I decided then to also do something about computer science at university, studying it, uh, finishing it, uh, and then I went into uh, my first job as a Java application developer in a company develop, who developed um, software for German banks and Sparkassen, right? So it was an old school business, but mm-hmm. they used modern technology mm-hmm. to to make better products for the people working in banks. Um, 
and was so cool. So um, the, the the joy I had, like like coding for three weeks in a row, and then <laughs> this moment of oh, I think it's done, and stepping back and seeing, yeah, no, it's working. And this, this <laughs> is working. right? And, and so this this, and I think it still drives me. We we will figure that out. But I, I'm even now that I'm doing coding far less than than in, my, in the beginning of my career because I've become an IT manager at some part in my in my career it's still the same joy for me if i have set up a team of people working and, and the, the chemistry is right and they understand what they're doing and they have the mm -hmm. right kinds and skills and they love what they're doing then i can step back and i still feel the ch it's like it's working the system <laughs> so um yeah fantastic um and so um how did you then when, when did your leadership career start you know how did you then get into leadership and i guess moving more away from you know being a hands-on um developer and coder yeah it was at first a very like gradual thing so um i mean if you work in a team you will always have people who are more eager to call the shots or to just make statement or help somebody out that was always that was always part of me like naturally um but in my first job where i was basically a coder i really felt a lot of pain about the processes we were doing mm -hmm. about the lack of team building the, the lack of um understanding the customers and i, I was thinking then there needs to be something better out there mm -hmm. and 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 basically was also when all this scrum and agile hit Germany big time. So this, mm -hmm. this was coming and it, it was like, oh, I have a problem. There's the answer with, with what in the end, right? Because nothing is that easy. But but still it's, it, it got me starting to, to read about processes, about um, engineering practices. And all those books were written by engineers or people who were very close to software development. And that was appealing to me. And so I decided then if I, after ha obtaining the knowledge, let me also train that let me teach that to my colleagues to the company so i i, I set up my um, book circles or i just was having half an hour of a presentation within the company about a certain uh, it process or software testing or something mm -hmm. um and, and so this was a gradual part right so where i it's a, just became sort of a leader for processes and software mm -hmm. testing and quality and at some point in time, I decided I want I want I want to really I want to really learn that like for real, and mm -hmm. then I then I decided I need to move on, and and I need to stop coding on a day to day basis. I need to become a Scrum master. That was the job back in the days, like how oh, back in the days, 2012, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you wanted to learn about like leadership tools and mm -hmm. team building and how to make make teams. Like good teams to great teams, this kind of things. Then Scrum Master was the job, and so I I, I switched roles and became a Scrum Master. Then with Mobile Lean Scout Twenty Four. Fantastic, fantastic, brilliant. Um, and so let's um, let's find out a bit more about your current um position or la la I guess last two positions that you've held. Um, because obviously you, you current role, you're currently CTO. You um you said earlier at the start actually that you'd had a very successful um day successful delivery of a, a project and um, so it'd be really great to understand more about um operating at head of and, and c level and i guess um you know what that looks like for you any challenges and and kind of pain points that you've experienced and anything as well that um you feel others that are wanting to follow in your footsteps could learn from um, any experiences that you think people could learn from so, as I said, for me, the the, the passion and the, the, the driving, the motivation is still the same. And so uh, also, I believe to, to a great deal, the way I think about my work, the models I use in my, in my head are the same. I try to create systems and environments for people to be able to do a great job within. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the same. If, you, if you're a scrum master and you have a five-person team, same story. If you are like a startup kind of CTO role, which I'm doing now, 100-person um, company, 20-person uh, software development team, right? Not, not, not real big, but that's the same thing. 
Um, and, and I believe it's even the same thing if it's a couple of hundred or thousand people, maybe your tools change and maybe you, um, you, need, you need to find ways uh, to stay effective, even if you cannot be on the grounds day to day, right? This is just not possible. You can have the same quality of interaction and, and trust relationship with 20 people as you have with three or four, at least I cannot, <laughs> maybe, right? So, the, so you need to scale it. And so you try to, to start to build your leadership team, people who, who um, you, you sort of uh, make like your, your bridge officers, your bridge crew, and who, who, who are very close to everyone in the organization on day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. but also very close to what, what I want, where I want leaders. And, and this, is, this is things that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But, but you asked about pain points, and, and mm -hmm. we have to talk about it at one or the other uh, point in time in this podcast. Clearly, the pandemic currently, and fighting, mm -hmm. and for the, the financial impact, and also the project impact, that is the biggest pain point uh, for me currently. Um, and, and, and just to touch on it, because when I joined Audubert, it, a lot of what I was doing was um, rebuilding and recreating. The, the processes and the team up to where we were very successful and, and delivering a high quality, high speed, uh, and then the pandemic hit us and that had, had an impact. And so it was sad to see some of our projects need to be stopped because yeah, cost wise, mm. right? And I, I, I saw some people moving on because in the end they decided that they rather want to work in an industry which is not affected by yeah. so much as others hospitality industry right it's, it's yeah, yeah of course and so there, there's some pain points coming from that yeah how is that um impacted because you said um i think you, you said you know like obviously you've joined or, or, um order bird is that kind of startup kind of um environment mm -hmm. um and obviously i should imagine you had some pretty um you know big growth plans in place before covid hit how how has that impacted um, growth plans and you know what does that you know what I guess how, how has that changed things over the next six to nine months or a year is that is you know has it slowed you down or what and um, you know is there anything that you've done as a business I know obviously a lot of businesses have have been pivoting haven't they and looking at other areas that they can generate revenue yeah absolutely so. Um... Thinking about Audubert, Audubert was founded in 2011, so it's already a nine-year-old startup, which, which tells you one thing, it has survived that long. And that is unusual for startups because mm -hmm. most of them go uh, out of business in their first year. Yeah. And mm -hmm. even the, those that survive, it takes them like multiple years to get uh, to profitability, if at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, with Audubert, we, we achieved that. Uh, last year, and we were still uh, aiming for high, high two-digit growth. So, very cool look, um, and uh, we were absolutely um, achieving our, our like our market leadership to even mm -hmm. stand that. And then the pandemic hit us. But what it has done, in fact, was that it put us in a position where we and all our competitors are now running this uphill kind of battle. Right, we were we were in, we were in this marathon kind of thing all the time, but now it's going uphill, and and then it is all about being the best in the uphill battle. Yeah, of course. We have done a very good job um, as a company, taking measures very early, um, having a, a great team of of highly inspired people who said let let's stick together, let's mm -hmm. still launch a new product which we have done uh, in, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, sorry i said oh fantastic that you still launched <laughs> and you still you know it's, it's a difficult time isn't it to be launching new products particularly in hospitality way. yeah, yeah exactly. how did that go then it, it so sure from the from the plain numbers of, of uh, how many customers we wanted to uh, get a contract with with a new product we are not yeah. at the budget not at the original budget but still when the crisis began, we, we lowered our expectations to, to like, a, like a very yeah. low forecast, and we are overachieving our forecast with the new product, with the old product, with uh, the revenue we're getting from our customers, with new customers. 
and, and so we, we can see that by applying certain measures fast, but still staying very engaged with our customer base um, and listening to what they need right now. They need different things in the pandemic than they did before. That helped us a lot. And I believe in the end, we will um, have like like strengthened our market leader position after the pandemic when, when we look into next year. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, no, that's interesting, isn't it? I guess as a, the product and the hospitality being hit so hard. Yeah. Although obviously over in Berlin, you're able to go out a lot more than we have been in the UK. I think, I think you probably had about, we had about four, five, maybe even six weeks of Sarah, who works over in our um, Berlin office, yeah. boasting about all the lovely dinners she was going for <laughs> whilst we were all at home still, which was... Um, yeah, we were getting frustrated, weren't we? Because we were so jealous that we wanted to go out and go to the pub. And yeah, but obviously it's been challenging yeah, times for everyone. Yeah. So to hear that there's still some business success is um, certainly yeah. some fantastic news. So I'd love to find out more about then your leadership style. Mm -hmm. So you run a team of, you said, 20 developers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. How would your team describe your style? Um, oh, no, the doorbell rings. Can we make it, can we take a short break? I guess. Yeah, 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 go for yeah. it. Yeah, that's fine. So it would be great then to hear a bit more about um, your leadership style. And also I'd love to know how that's adapted from the your role as a scrum master and those co collaboration tools and techniques that you've used and how you've had to adapt and what you've learned from moving from that position to your CTO role today. Mm -hmm. So, so... I, I hope <laughs> that my team will tell you uh, a couple of things about me. Yeah. And, and most importantly, that, that I am a good translator. Um, yeah. By that I mean, so one thing that I've done as a scrum master very successfully, and I'm still doing in all other IT leadership management positions is, I really, for myself, I really try to understand the business. So what are we doing here? What is our mission? What is our business strategy as compared to our competitors? What makes us special as a business? And then our product, so our product basically and the ideas we're having on the roadmap, they need to contribute to the strategy. So I try to get the link in my head about that. And, and if I have that, then I, I am able to give good guidance um, to the tech team about um, which technologies would be applicable. Uh, what, what needs to be done fast and simple? Uh, where, where should we rather put an extra effort because that thing will scale in the future, right? Mm -hmm. right? Th those decisions. It's, it's, I have had the experience in the past that for, for many development teams, that is kind of a blurry area. So like we're working on, on, on tasks on a day-to-day -day basis, but what is it in the end contributing to the business? How is that making us successful? That what I'm doing right now. And if you think about it, this whole agile concept is about self-organizing teams. This, right? This you want the experts yeah. teams mm -hmm. want to enable them to make decisions. So uh, basically, they need to have the same knowledge as the CEO, right? Not in every detail, but like directionally, they need yeah. to understand yeah. so they can make good decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. The so business and commercial knowledge, which I've, I've never had anyone say actually, but before, but it, yeah, I guess it it, it makes real sense. Absolutely, and this is mm -hmm. this is basically the, the most the most important thing that 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 I'm doing is always trying to translate, always grabbing product managers, business developers, mm -hmm. saying, "Hey, you need to tell that to the team. Hey, share that presentation with the team." Um, and also, if you would apply for for an IT management job at Audibert, mm -hmm. one of my questions would be, "Please tell me how your former uh, employer did monetize product ABC." Mm -hmm. so you would apply for an IT management role, maybe engineering manager. I just expect that you understand how your business monetizes or something like that because yeah, yeah. this is what I need. Because how are you going to be able to prioritize accordingly if, if yeah. not? Yeah. And actually it makes real sense because I think it's really important to be able to take your team on that journey. And by in order by doing that, you that's what you're allowing, which is going to help the business longer term, right? Make you more efficient. So that certainly makes sense and it's one of those things that quite a lot of time um leaders don't take the time to do and the devs are there just to develop and that's it and it's not it's all about taking people on that journey and, and seeing and and to be fair they're going to get more out of that as well right they're going to get more job satisfaction if they know that what they're creating is going to what value it's going to bring to the business bring to the customer um yeah it's brilliant okay so before we went on this recording you were telling us about one of your 
projects that happened released today and it was a success and it was going nice and smooth <laughs> touch wood it will continue on that trajectory yeah. but we learn more from our failures so i would love to know about one project or something in your career that didn't go quite as planned but you learned a lot from it um yeah sure and, and, and there's always this the thing that comes to mind when people ask that kind of question because that was really a fuck up back in the days <laughs> and, and it was not so much a, like a high cost failure or something like that i mm -hmm. i had maybe i was lucky i never really worked in a classical project business right mm -hmm. i'm always in a product business so yeah, I, yeah. The, the, the rules are a bit different but when i think about projects uh, i was part of a couple of organizational change projects in the past. Mm -hmm. Being uh, the head of an agile department at Immobilien Scout 24, we did a lot of organizational change back then. And I, I remember um, very well that at, at one point in time, even this team of scrum masters and agile coaches and project managers, I, I was so clear that we needed to change ourselves. We needed to change how we offer services to the company how the, co the company perceives us, how we how we make sure that we add value as a scrum master and coaching team to the company. Mm -hmm. and, and I was so fast having a vision and I was very clear about it. Um, and then I did a couple of workshops and kickoffs and, and all of a sudden I realized at least for a couple of people in the room, uh, that was super unhelpful and mm -hmm. they, they needed different things than, than I could offer. And, and, and I lost some on the way um, they 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 felt like um, I create a lot of anxiety and unclarity mm -hmm. by saying, "Hey, today we do this, but tomorrow we do something else completely different, but it will be great." That that was working for me, and for for some, but it wasn't working for everybody. And um, so what I learned back then is that it's tough hearing that feedback, though. <laughs> oh, it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. It's tough, but it's what you do with it, isn't it? And it sounds like you've obviously taken that on board and and. Well, yes, but this is no years behind me. So, but yes, it is tough. But the one thing that you can can um, rely on is if you lead a team of scrum masters and agile coaches, they give you feedback. <laughs> right. This this uh, this was really helpful. First, like let's say, really being the boss of somebody experience. And, and so I had the, 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 the greatest teachers in my employees because they were basically telling me all the time that I'm doing it wrong. And <laughs> that I'm wrong. So this, this was, was good. But, but in that specific thing, what I learned is that in, in, in change projects, different people need very different guidance. And for some, it, it is okay to just give a strong vision and then they are inspired and they just run. And others... They need a plan. The, mm. They needed me to tell them how we get there. Mm. Okay, tomorrow we do phase one and then here. And these mm -hmm. are three open mm -hmm. questions, but we're working on that. And that was totally not me. I, 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 I didn't want to do it, and I'm not pretty good at doing this. So I needed to find ways then in later projects to get those things, or at least put some clarity on the table and saying, this I know, this I don't. Please help me. Right? And, and, and so that was a failure that, that really hopefully made me, made me a better change manager. Right? Brilliant. It's fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant. So um, I'd like to, I think it'd be really interesting if you could understand um, more about your passions um, in life. Obviously, you've, um, you talked very, to me, you talked very passionate about how you started your career and your coding. Um, obviously, you're very passionate about your um, leadership style um, and you know, and that being all about the people and, and carrying them on through that journey. Um, what would you what else would you say that you're really, really passionate about? And, and, and this could be in work, out of work, or something that's out of work that would impact your profession and your career. Yeah. I, I, first of all, I think and maybe we touch on that later, I don't see my life as like, like a clear separation between work and private life. Mm. I, consider, mm -hmm. I consider my work being part of my private life for good and worse, but, but I cannot make yeah. that decision. <laughs> uh, and when it comes <laughs> to passion, uh, this is also a, a double-edged sword because passion really 
makes me work harder maybe or be more mm. inspiring or what but it also makes me more emotional uh and and so what the, when people perceive me as being most passionate is when i when i feel that they they really don't get how product development teams are working or are supposed to work so consider an environment where, where you have people just asking you hey please deliver that fast until tomorrow kind of scenario right that that, that can make me angry and, and and i really get passionate about uh, passionate about <laughs> educating, educating those those people They're exactly about, the same <laughs> aren't we <laughs> right? um, let, let me tell you what complexity <laughs> And let me tell you why it is not just difficult to give a good estimate in a software development project, but by law of nature, impossible because complexity. So th there are models out there. There are things, there's history of software and product development. And um, so many companies utilize digital product development to make to generate value and still at the same time don't understand it, right? Not, not to the heart. Um, other, other situations, just to give you another example, you will have you will have failures and mistakes and incident kind of situations now and then if you operate software environments, because you sit on top of a of a deep stack of tools and frameworks and third party services, and all of them can have those problems. So even if you are perfect, which you cannot be, then something will fail. If something fails. It's very important to stay calm, rational, to give the people the room to think about solving it, to give them an, an environment of psychological safety. This is the best you can do to solve the problem fast. There are people in the world who have problems with that, right? who get angry, who start yelling at you or start showing you emotions. Some unintentionally, some will do that intentionally and because they believe, let's add this extra bit of pressure to the team, I understand that makes us slower. So that, that makes me very passionate. And, and then I start again my my, my lecturing. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's good to hear about how you kind of manage expectations, manage above, which uh, yeah, I think that's really useful when you gave some good tips around that. But any tips around that are really useful because I know it's it's constantly, isn't it, something that people struggle with managing yeah. up. Definitely. Um yeah. You said um, you were talking earlier about, um, I think, some like books and things that you've been reading um, or you have read. Um, and I think it'd be quite good to, you, you sound like you're, um, you know, the sort of person that obviously if you need to learn something or if you've had a life lesson or learned from experience, then you will... Um, you know, find the best kind of book or training course or something to kind of help you and keep developing yourself. Um, I think it'd be really good to, I don't know if you've got any really good, decent recommendations for books or training courses or anything, any online material for podcasts. our listeners. And podcasts. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not for this one, obviously. <laughs> yeah, so, so, sure. So there were a couple of, I, I don't know, two dozen really great books who mm -hmm. made me rethink the way I work. And also also then um, they even reached out into what you would call my private life. So they mm -hmm. changed me as a person. And 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 um, being who I am, I, I always found that if a book is well written, it gives me so much more depth and insight and 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 models to work with than than just chatting with someone in an open space kind of scenario, which is also nice. But a couple of, so so the classic Tom DeMarco's People Were he, he wrote in the eighties, and mm -hmm. the, the main statement is software is about people. It's not about software. And, and, and he makes so many good examples. And also he did with his company back then empirical studies on, on software development teams. And they are still so true and insightful. And, and then later I, I started reading books which are strong from a like theoretical point of view. So they have strong models and, and, and some find them uh, hard to digest, but, but still they, they gave me so much in, in, in having, having systems and, and, and to think about stuff like, uh, the Art of Action, Stephen Bungay, who influenced a lot the, the, the uh, Henrik Nieberg, the Spotify and this alignment and autonomy chart kind of thinking, actually mm -hmm. written in his book before 
and, and so that was really great to see. Or um, to, to mention um, Don Reinertsen, The Product Development Flow. It, yeah, right. yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's a book, it's already 10 years old, I guess, mm -hmm. but it's a book mm -hmm. who using the mathematics of queuing theory to explain to you how you optimize the flow in your product management team. Cool. All right. So and it's stuff that you've taken on board and it's helped helped yeah. your teams. It, it helped me think. So it is not like, hey, we should do that and then yeah. get faster. Mm -hmm. But identifying issues in my teams, understanding what is healthy, what is not healthy. Th those kind of books really did a lot to me. But That's but good. Let me add one more thing because you, you, you asked about trainings. I, I really need to yeah. say that the biggest step when it, when it came to becoming a better leader was personal coaching, which I received. So I had a very good coach who helped me uh, over one and a half years, like weekly telephone call, a couple of on-site visits. And I just had someone to talk through my difficult face-to-face, -face, difficult mm -hmm. people management decisions. And, and he just helped me to reflect on my own thinking. And that was, that was great. Is that something that you did, that you um, organized personally yourself or was that through an organization that you worked with? So uh, this coach was also, he was giving leadership training for some leaders at Immobilien Squad 24 before, uh, before that. And, and then I just decided I go with him as a coach. I made that happen. I, I requested some budget for training and then that, that happened. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Sounds like it was a good investment that helps. Sometimes you just need a bit of a sounding board, mm. don't you? And I think yeah, it's so important to have that to someone to say, yeah, yeah do you know what, Frank, you're doing the right thing there. That's, yeah, that's, that's definitely the way to go about it. So, um, yeah, that's amazing. I have a question for you because you mentioned earlier that it's hard for you to switch off because you love your work and your work drips into your home life, vice versa. I'd love to know how you're managing that and what you, how you kind of like manage the stress of it all and how you deal with that. Cause that's definitely a challenge that the environment we live in, particularly when people are home working so often, it's so easy to stay on your phone all night or on your laptop, but it'd be interesting to find out how, how you're coping with that. Yeah. Let me try to explain that because I know it's, it's different from how most of the, um, many other people perceive it. Um, yeah. For, for me, as I, as I said, for me, there, there is no, the, the work and what I do at work is for me is part of my private life. So mm -hmm. I get the same joy out of what I'm doing at work and the same stress and sometimes annoyance or frustrations that I get from every other part of my life. Mm -hmm. Be it practicing guitar and it doesn't work, uh, be it talking to my kids and it doesn't work. <laughs> so you get the idea, right? <laughs> Every part of my life um, is, is full of joy and gives me, gives me a lot of energy, including mm -hmm. work. And sure, sometimes there's stress and frustration, mm -hmm. but, but it is not that I have to say, oh, work, this is the stressy part, and now I yeah. need a vacation. I don't feel like that about work. M maybe I'm very lucky. But maybe yeah, you know, that's great. You obviously, it's clear that you love your job so much, it doesn't feel like work, but, which but is the important thing. Said this, but it is still important for, for everything that I do, it's important that I at some point in time stop doing it and turn my attention to something else. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's true for work. And then if I get stuck in, in writing a document and my, my mind is not is not sharp anymore, sure I do something else. Yeah. yeah. Mixing it up. Other with every other thing. That's definitely really important. Mm. So I always love to end the podcast with finding out about what you're most excited are about and what your plans are so what what big things have you got on the agenda at order bird what about you personally what's making you jump out of bed in the morning without a smile on your face Frank? <laughs> what are you excited about <laughs> well yes yeah, so for my personal journey i really i really would like to continue learning and learning and learning throughout mm -hmm. my entire professional career and 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 so having the opportunity to like let's say every couple of years to 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 change my environment and right, to yeah. apply my my knowledge from the past to new situations, but then also to get new knowledge. Mm -hmm. That is something that I definitely want to keep doing throughout throughout my throughout my career. 
uh, and then uh, uh, on, on the horizon <laughs> when it comes to learning, I even think about uh, at some point in time, maybe when I'm retired, going back to university and, and finishing the oh, physics wow. study, which I which I did back then, but I didn't finish because wow. I didn't. Wow. Oh. That is really, this is okay. like on the bucket list kind of thing, right? <laughs> Not sure I can go back to full time studying again. <laughs> I think when I retire, I'll be sat on a beach somewhere with a pina colada. <laughs> but it sounds like that's a, that sounds great though. Like it's brilliant, and it's it's so important to keep learning and keep challenging yourself there. Like I think you made yeah. a good point around like staying a bit out of your comfort zone and uh, pushing yourselves to progress and better yourself. Which is yeah, that's really cool. So great way to end the podcast. It has been amazing hearing your story and um, a pleasure to spend some time with you this afternoon like you've got a great energy frank so you can tell you're a, good, a fantastic leader so it's been um, brilliant having you on the show and finding out more about your story if anyone wants to reach out and get in touch is it best on linkedin twitter what's the best form of contact for you well it depends so professional stuff happens on linkedin um I haven't used Twitter in a while. I'm on Instagram with my <laughs> hobby and uh, my hobbies and, and nerd kind of Warhammer 40k. <laughs> what's your what's your nerd hobby? What did you say? I, I, there are many nerd hobbies, but on Instagram mm. it's about miniature painting for for tabletop games. So you oh, know, like Warhammer. Warhammer 40k, exactly. Warhammer, yeah. Oh, cool, yeah, yeah. I've never done it, but I, when I was younger, I always wanted to see the painting. Oh, just seen your kitten. Is it? Oh yeah, you got a cat behind. Oh, yes, is that one of your? Your... Yeah, this is this is Peabody. Uh, Atlas, the other one is probably somewhere else. Uh, she's now on the top of the tabletop board game. That's she not was... Warhammer, though, is it? What's that? It is. It is, it a, is? It's a Warhammer table, yeah. Oh, is it? <laughs> what's, what's your Instagram handle? I'm going to have a look. <laughs> In my private life, uh, my nickname is Toaster, like the toaster. Toaster. But even more complicated, the T's are sevens. Seven. Seven. <laughs> right, I'm going to go have a look at your Warhammer painting. Have a look. Right, it's been fantastic having you on the show. Thank you so yeah, much. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>